And yeah. uh, as you know, my wife's about to give birth to our, our first child. Congratulations. So, thank you very much. And I, I um, you know, we mentioned Alexander Solzhenitsyn earlier. Yeah. And one of the things that he did, and he, he kind of, um, he turned a lot of people off in the West when he came from the Soviet Union, he went to America and he mm. was perceived as sort of lecturing Americans about their moral decadence. And, mm. and um, I, I'm not someone who's, I'm not an outsider here to tell you how to run your country and run your life. I'm one of you now, yeah. I'm here and my children are gonna live in this country and that's why I care deeply about what's going to happen in this society. So uh, all I'm trying to do is remind people of the things that are underpin the value, the values, the freedoms, the prosperity that we enjoy here. They didn't fall out of the sky, John, as you well know. Yeah. They come from centuries of ideological discussion, of war. People have bled to make this country as prosperous and as free as it is. And I think we owe it to ourselves to not forget that and to remember the value of everything that, 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 that's that that been created here. These are not accidents. It is not an accident that Russian people like Sergei Brin uh, have to leave the Soviet Union with their family and go to America, and that's where they start Google. It's not an accident that people have to flee China and, and Russia and emigrate and build their businesses and create the things that they create elsewhere. These are not accidents. The West is not more technologically advanced by virtue of some kind of historical misunderstanding. There are reasons for that, right? And of course, part of that reason is Western countries have been dominant in the world. But another part is the system of government and the way that we do business in the West has facilitated that. And uh, I don't want us to lose that. And I don't want my children to, to live in a society that falls behind. You know, uh, this, this is one of the big concerns I have uh, with many people in the West is they... Uh, we've been so successful in the West, we've been so comfortable in the West that we forget that at the end of the day, life is a competition. And there, as we talked about last time, when you interviewed me the first time, I made this point. People in Russia and China are not sitting around doing identity politics. As I said at the time, they're getting ready. And now you're starting to see the Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, talked only days ago about how the purpose of what they're doing in Ukraine is to push America out of Eastern Europe, and it is to end the American global dominance in the world. That's what people want, and make no mistake about it, they're coming for what we have. And I've tried to make this point to people over and over and over again. We don't live in some magical rainbow-colored world in which everyone wants to live happily and, and trade and whatever. Yes, that's part of it, but there are, there are a lot of people in the world who just want what we have, and they're coming. Our Prime Minister deserves a lot more credit for his framing up of the very things you're talking about. He's talked about an arc of autocracy uh, and we need to be alert to that. And it, it, this is what's so valuable about what you're saying because you understand what autocracy is like. Mm. You can see what we've got and why it's worth fighting for. I, I feel that very strongly. I think it's really important. Uh, and w you know, one of the things that I think we, it's very difficult not to take for granted things to which you've never experienced an alternative. If you've always lived in a prosperous democracy, how it's like the sky. Mm. What, you don't expect the sky to fall down upon you, right? In the same way, you don't expect democracy to end. You don't expect your freedoms to be curtailed. But we've seen even over the last two years that uh, that um, softness that we've developed and that comfort causes us, I think, to be vulnerable. Uh, we are so attached to, to safety and comfort and stability that we will throw away our rights uh, and freedoms when push comes to shove. And that worries me. You touched on the fact that it took years, centuries, and bloodshed mm. and a lot of deep, deep thinking and what have you uh, to, to develop the institutions of freedom in the West. We're now very cynical about our leaders. That's dangerous. When we become cynical about the institutions, that's even more dangerous. I had a searing moment seven or eight years ago. I, um, through a, a charity I was involved with, embedded myself in a tertiary education institution in Myanmar, the old Burma. Hmm. And after I'd been there about three or four days, I was about to leave. It was really noticeable, many of them, they saw me as some sort of quasi authority figure. You know, I'd been something in a Western country and they were a bit wary of me. The sort of natural leaders in a class came up to me afterwards. You could tell they were the natural leaders. And their spokesman, uh, a young man, looked me in the eye and he said, 
in terms of great exasperation, we'd just like to ask you, we think the generals that are tragically wrong are going to open up and we'll get some democracy. And he said, how do we build a democracy? How do we build a system of elections uh, and what have you that work? How do we build a justice system? How do we build a welfare system? How do we build an education system? How do we build, fund, plan for infrastructure? Mm. And I thought, these are such big questions. And all I could say was it took us years, centuries to do it in the West. But we could throw it all away far too quickly. Mm. Well, I think that's true we could do, but I also have never been more optimistic mm. in the last few years than I, ha I am now. It could be just the the upcoming fatherhood is, is forcing me to take an optimistic view, which is extremely unnatural mm. for me, both as an individual and as a Russian. But um, <laughs> uh, I wonder whether... <sighs> I've been very surprised by the West's reaction to Ukraine. Yeah. Very pleasantly so, yeah. John. I, when the the invasion happened, Francis and I, my co-host, sat mm. here and, and we talked about live or about what was happening. And I said many things which have turned out to be correct. I said some things which we are yet to see if they're correct. And I said some things which haven't turned out to be right. For example, I said NATO's over. Mm. I don't mm. think that's true yeah. anymore. We've seen a strength of response from the West that's been unexpected. Yeah. Now we can quibble with, you know, should Germany have sold off or closed down their nuclear power plants? Probably not, mm. right? And I've been saying this for years. Mm. Should they've made themselves as reliant on Russian oil and gas as they have? No, they shouldn't. But generally the reaction from the West has been far stronger mm. than what I expected. I don't know if you were surprised by it as well. Uh, very much so. And, and like you, delighted. Yeah. The greatest danger is we drop the ball, get bored, and back off. Yeah. So Germany, we haven't done that. No. We haven't done that. But there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go. But Germany paying a very high price at this point, very impressive. And a left of centre government with a green foreign minister is saying we've got a double defence expenditure. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Yeah. Well, it's the wake up call perhaps that the West is needed. Yeah. So I'm optimistic on that. I think on the cultural stuff, we're starting to see shifts. You know, I don't want to get too too deep into the weeds of the culture war, but I've said from day one that I thought the trans issue would be what broke this whole thing. And I think slowly but surely you're starting to see that as you see waves of people who've transitioned because they were encouraged yeah. to, uh, and now regretting it. Mm. Tragic stories, by the way, John. These are oh. people who've mutilated their own bodies and now coming back. And by the way, look, we've had a ton of trans people on our show who deserve to be treated respectfully, who deserve to be uh, enjoy every opportunity and freedom in life, just as all the rest of us do. Uh, but some of the excesses of that ideology, not the people, but the ideology, we're now starting to see the consequences of that, mm. about which we've been warning for some time. You had uh, the Kira Bell case here. We had the Kira Bell case, but there's thousands of people like Kira mm. behind that as well, yeah. you've got to remember. Uh, and you're starting to see them pop up now, and, and hopefully... The, you know, we can stop all this craziness before it gets too late and before the numbers just become astronomical. But, you know, we're starting to see uh, enough pushback against some of these excesses that that at least the pendulum is slowing, perhaps, maybe even starting to swing to another direction. And so my concern is that we don't overswing back because there is a risk always that if you antagonize people uh, along racial lines, if you antagonize people along sexuality lines, you end up with a position where we actually start to roll back some of the advances we've had. And, and instead of going, well, look, maybe the trans ideology has gone too far. We've got to protect our children from being encouraged to transition in one way or another. People start to actually go, well, this whole LGBTQ thing and gay people, you know, all of that gets thrown out with the bathwater. We've got to be careful. So that I think is actually one of the concerns for me as well. As we adjust, and, and our culture starts to shift perhaps back somewhere or in a different, healthier direction. We've got to make sure we don't overswing as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm starting to see some positive moves on that side of things as well. Uh, so I'm optimistic. I'm, we've got to be optimistic, John. We must be optimistic. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I, uh, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is I want people in the West to wake up and to recognize the, the, the tremendous value of what we have here. But I also have to say, you know, I hope it's your children and grandchildren and my children and grandchildren who are the ones who are building that better society. And if we take responsibility, which we should do, for making sure that we are educating our mm. children correctly, which we haven't been for quite a long time, if they understand history, not just 
British history or colonial history, but history, John, history. History means context. It means you understand not only what the British Empire was doing in the 18th century, but also what the Russian Empire was doing in the 18th century mm -hmm. and what the Arab slave traders were doing while the Western colonial powers were engaging in the horrific mm -hmm. uh, transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. That's history. Mm -hmm. If we can teach our children that, if they can understand the context, I think there's a very real chance that the West can prosper again. I couldn't agree more because he's really hit on something that strikes me as really important here. Um, who says slavery is wrong? Where did that idea come from? Mm. It was endemic in just about every culture and every society across the world. And we're right here in the city where it was determined by a culture that it was wrong. Mm. And a massive investment was made in ending it, not just in this country, which is the most powerful on earth at the time, but in obliterating it everywhere else. But that part of the story is not told. It's contextualization. Mm. So now we've got a move to de-statue, I understand, in Edinburgh, um, uh, the uh, uh, Livingston, you know, the famous uh, African explorer mm. and abolitionist, mm. on the basis that when he was 10 years old, effectively a, a, a slave labourer, I suppose, he worked in a cotton factory and the cotton would have been produced by slaves. Mm. Where's the contextualisation? That's the point you're making. That uh, is I, the I point I'm making. I have a whole chapter about slavery in the book and I talk about my grandfather being taken a slave labourer mm. to Germany the fact that, as I told you, my great-grandfather, who was in the Gulag as mm. the engineer, do you remember we talked about yes. it earlier? Yeah. He served his sentence com on completely spurious mm. grounds of 10 years, and he was kept in the mm. camps for another three years because he was needed. Mm. He was a slave. Mm. And this was in living memory, right? So we shouldn't pretend that slavery um, is in any way unique to the West. Mm. It's an awful, awful thing, John. Uh, oh, but, but every society has engaged in it throughout history, and that's the context through which we need to look at ourselves. Uh, it's easier for me, being a dark-skinned immigrant, to talk about it, which is one of the reasons that I wrote the book, because I think there are plenty of people in the West who disagree and criticize and critique some of these cultural movements that we've seen. But I think as an outsider, I have perhaps a little bit more leeway, and, and I can give a bit more context that people aren't necessarily aware of, because we've been guilt-tripped. We've been guilt tripped about our past. You you don't have any responsibility for things that happened 400 years ago. And I don't think anyone should feel guilt because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. I think the reintroduction of racialized thinking into our societies mm -hmm. is one of the worst things that we could do to ourselves. That's why I've been pushing back so strongly against mm -hmm. it. I don't want my black friends to be treated differently because they're black. And I don't want my white friends to be treated differently because they're white. And the fact that we now live in a society where it's become acceptable to say, oh, you're a white man or, or whatever. And that is somehow a dismissive thing that, that like that Im implies with it that you have some sort of lower value in the hierarchy of who's allowed to express an opinion or whatever. Mm. I think it's outrageous. Mm. I think it's disgusting and I think it needs to end. And I am determined uh, that as a result of the conversations that we have on this show and you have on your show and the broader leaking of that into the public domain, because I think a lot of people are fed up of it, frankly, yeah. John, uh, I am determined that that ends. Yeah. We've got to go back to the point, and I, I sort of tweeted a quip about it the other day. I said, I, I, I have a dream that one day um, th our ideas will be judged on their merit as opposed to the color of our skins. Yeah. We should be able to say what we think yeah. uh, and irrespective of where we come from, mm -hmm. That is the Western idea. That is, to me, why the West is worth preserving. It is the only part of the world, John, in the history of the world, where that idea has actually been embraced. Ever. Ever. And, you know, there are challenges with building multi-ethnic societies like the ones we have in the West. It's dealt very differently in other countries, as you know. In China, it's very different. In Russia, it's the same. Uh, most of the rest of the world operates on a very simple basis. There is an ethnic group that is the dominant one of that society. Everybody else is some sort of second-class citizen. And that's the way that it is. We are trying to do better here. We're trying desperately. And it comes with difficulties and it comes with challenges and it comes with problems. But we are desperately trying. And we should be encouraged and celebrated for that, not talked about like we're the worst people in the world, because we're not. Your concern that people live in freedom and dignity and so forth shines through. Give us a taste. Give us a teaser. You've got a book coming out in July. Hmm. What should we know about it so that uh, we can decide whether to go and get a copy? Well, uh, I talk a lot in the book about things that you probably don't know about. Uh, and I relate them to what's happening in the West. I mean, one of my central themes in the book is to relate my family history 
and my own experiences, the experience of my parents and my family, uh, whether that was being born in the Gulag or my grandfather being exiled from the late Soviet Union for his views on Afghanistan, or whether it's other things that most people in the West probably are not familiar with, um, and how they relate to what's happening here. I talk, for example, about where political correctness comes from. Do you know? No. It comes from the Soviet Union. He was invented in the Soviet Union and had nothing ever to do with any sort of politeness or respect for other people. Political correctness was a way of saying to people, comrade, this is factually correct, but it's politically incorrect. And what it meant was it was inconvenient to the party line. And many of the things that are now happening have an explanation. And I, I dig into some of that in the book as well. And, you know, one of my, the, I suppose my main argument is, and you'll like this because of your religious uh, beliefs, I suppose, is we have to learn gratitude again for what we have. And I think the only way to do that is to appreciate how unique it is, how unusual it is, how extraordinarily unlikely what we enjoy in the West is. A garden in a jungle. Quite. And we're letting the weeds take over the garden. We're in danger of letting the jungle encroach. Quite. And the only way to do that is the garden has to be protected, John. It has to be guarded. It has to be nurtured. It has to be watered and appreciated by the people who walk in that garden and enjoy the fruits of it.